presentation by Turner and so we're going to start off with the basic flow of the water cycle. So we're going to start down here with um, groundwater. And the first stage that it goes through is evaporation, and that is when the sun heats up the water and brings it into the atmosphere. And that also goes along with transpiration, which is bringing the water, basically bringing the water out of the plants. And then when the water is in the atmosphere, it goes through condensation, which, cre which creates clouds. And then it goes through precipitation when the cloud is full, and crystallization, which is basically snow and hail and ice. And then the water that hasn't been frozen or melts goes down the mountains and everything, and it goes through downhill flow, and then accumulates back into the groundwater, and the cycle starts over again. Many of the most common land features that we see around us today were formed by the process of weathering and erosion. Weathering and erosion is where wind, water, or, or kind of like nature's forces force rock and other materials to make interesting shapes and figures and forms. This is in, such as canyons and caves, and this is an example of wind erosion, but there's also other rock caves as well. But um, canyons, they're an example of when a river starts cutting through a landscape and then all the rock on the side starts to kind of slope down towards it and become jaggedy and stiff and, and it has lines, kind of like sedimentary. And caves, that's where an underwater reservoir, such as a lake or some sort of groundwater, it, it erodes all of the rock around it and it forms stalactites and stalagmites. Stalactites are from the Okay, um, so some of the current effects that we see with the geological effects of the water cycle are surface and underground. Surface effects include rivers and streams, which as the water flows, it creates a road on the ground, weathering the land below it. And an underground example would be underground caves. These are formed from eroding minerals and water that, um, and, wa and eroding water. And a lot of times you'll even see um, lakes that are still on the bottom from the existing water. And then there is stalagmites and stalactites. Stalagmites on the bottom and stalactites on the bottom, the, or on the top. The way I like to think of it is kind of like how Olivia said, stalactites, they have to stay tight on the bottom. And stalagmites, I just kind of think of it, it might go up because it's like going against gravity. I don't know, it's just not a good way of thinking of it. Some of the prehistoric evidence we have to prove that Pangea really did exist were large chunks of ice called glaciers. They slowly move across landscapes and leave like a sort of line pattern on the rocky ground. And as they go along, they pick up small particles of rocks and then they eventually deposit them in completely different areas. And as an example of the evidence, now we are seeing some some of those line patterns on the ground in warmer climates, such as Africa and South America. But right now, maybe, I don't know, 100 years back, there wouldn't be glaciers there, so that proves that somehow, some way, the deposits used to be in a different shape as well. And another, that was one of the examples of how we can see how Pangea um, is, well, how our Earth used to be. Like, and this is an example, this is a picture of Pangea, and another example that we can use to know that um, over time the continents have been moving is through fossil records. When you look at fossil records, you can see that the continents fit together almost like puzzle pieces, and you can see that they all fit together from where the fossils have been found from different places. So here is our display. So. starts down here with the groundwater. Now the groundwater could be a cave, it could be just some sort of reservoir that isn't a cave yet, but it's still there. And eventually this groundwater gets sucked up into the roots of plants, such as this little plant right here. And then the plants, their water, it gets evaporated, but it has a special word for it called transpiration. 
That's where all the water is sucked back out. And it goes to condensation and becomes cloud. And after evaporation and transpiration, um, the water forms clouds through condensation. And then when the clouds are full, it goes, um, the water leaves the clouds and it goes through precipitation. Some of the water is, goes through crystallization and forms on the tops of mountains and things like that. And it'll stay up there. And the water that doesn't, the water that hasn't frozen goes through downhill flow and then it accumulates back into the water in the ground and the cycle starts over again.